Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment presents for your listening enjoyment John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Roger Stern, Dollar. Oh, hello, Mr. Stern. What can I do for you? We insure Mr. James Forbes. He was killed last night. It looks like an accident, but there's always the chance it might not be. Can you take the job? Sure. How about the details? Well, come on down to the office as soon as you can, and I'll give you what we've got. I'll catch the first train out. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund and another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste, Plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Intercontinental Indemnity and Bonding Corporation, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the James Forbes matter. Expense account item one, $13.95, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. After receiving from you the details regarding the death of James Forbes, I registered at the Madison Hotel and went directly to the 5th Precinct Police Station and interviewed Lieutenant Arthur Parkhill, who was handling the case. Well, there really isn't much more to tell, Mr. Dollar. Other than what you know. You're convinced it was an accident? I'm convinced he fell over the edge of a 110-foot cliff, but it looks like an accident. Certainly doesn't mean the case is closed, but so far there's no motive for murder. There's a wife. Yeah. Mr. Forbes had quite a bit of money. Well, that's an understatement. Mr. Forbes was loaded. And Mrs. Forbes gets everything, including a half-million-dollar insurance policy. Look, that's the first thing we considered, but just because her husband's got money and a great big fat insurance policy... Now, wait a minute. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job. And we've checked the wife. Checked her good. The way it looks, she liked being married. She was in love with her husband. When he went over the cliff, she was in the house. Four servants can swear to it. He just fell over the cliff. According to everything we can find out, he took long walks every night along the cliffs by the ocean. Last night, it was unusually foggy. Certainly possible he got too close to the edge, missed his footing, and did a high dive. How about suicide? Uh-uh. At least there's no reason we can come up with good health business doing better than it ever has? Textiles, isn't it? Yeah, biggest in the country. There's absolutely nothing that indicates suicide, especially no suicide note. There usually is. Uh-huh. The Forbes estate is out on the island, isn't it? Yeah. Going to take a run-up? Yeah, I thought I might. Well, thanks for your help. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. Let me know if you come across anything. Expense account item two. 75 cents. Cab fare to a garage where I rented a car and drove out to the island. The Forbes mansion stood in the middle of a lot of acreage along the shore at the northeastern tip. Yes? I'd like to see Mrs. Forbes, please. I'm afraid Mrs. Forbes is seeing no one. Tell her Mr. Dollar is here. I believe Mr. Stern from my company called Mrs. Forbes and told her I was coming out. Uh, Mr. Dollar? That's right. If you'll wait a moment. Sure. Take your time. Mrs. Forbes will see you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Mrs. Forbes was expecting you, but neglected to tell me. Mr. Dollar, ma'am. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'm Mrs. Forbes. How do you do? Won't you sit down? Thank you. Mr. Stern called, said you were coming out. He seemed to think it was necessary. Yes, routine. Unfortunately, in a matter like this... I understand. 
Better to get it over with. I suppose so. Just a few questions. What time did Mr. Forbes leave the house last night? Right after dinner, around nine. I understand he was in the habit of taking walks. Yes. Last night was the same as any other night. Yes. He seemed uh, all right? He was fine. Wonderful spirits. Who found him? The police. Did you call them? Yes, after he'd been gone longer than usual, I began to worry. By 12 o'clock, I sent William, my butler, out in the car to look for him. When William returned, I had him call the police. They didn't find him until morning. You're convinced it was an accident? My husband didn't commit suicide, Mr. Dollar. Did he have any enemies? No. No one killed him, Mr. Dollar. Now, if you don't mind, I really don't feel too well. Of course. There's just one more thing. Yes? I'd like to take a look at the place, the, the spot. I'll have William show you. Thanks. I'm sorry I can't be of more help, Mr. Dollar, but there's really nothing to help you with. My husband was killed in an accident. He wasn't murdered, and he didn't commit suicide. My husband was a fine and wonderful man. I loved him very much. Of course. I'll call with him and have him show you the way down to the cliffs. It's been nice meeting you. This is a terrible thing, William. Yes, sir. How long have you been with the Forbes? Uh, ten years, sir. Theirs was a good marriage. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, about another hundred yards, sir. Uh, you can stop here. Right over here, sir. They found Mr. Forbes right down there, sir. Hmm. Long drop. Yes, sir. Well, I guess under the right circumstances, it'd be pretty easy to miss your footing along here. It was very foggy last night. Yeah. Well, come on. I'll drive you back. Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Dollar, I don't know quite how to say this. I've nothing ready to go on except, well, uh, I'm not convinced that Mr. Forbes' death was an accident. Why aren't you? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, until this morning, until some time after they found him, I didn't think it could be anything else. Uh, when the police questioned me, I didn't even consider another possibility. But Mr. Forbes has been taking walks at night, every night ever since I came to work. He's walked in all kinds of weather. He knew those cliffs from one end of, to the other. Well, people take showers in the same shower year after year, and still a certain percentage of them slip and break their necks. It's not just the walks and the fact that Mr. Forbes was so familiar with these cliffs. It's a lot of little things that have happened over the past two or three months. Uh, nothing really definite. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, telephone calls. What kind of telephone calls? Several times Mrs. Forbes has made calls. Several times I happened to overhear part of the conversations. They were affectionate. Affectionate? Yes, I, I thought she was talking to Mr. Forbes. But several times I discovered through dinner conversations between Mr. and Mrs. Forbes that she hadn't spoken to him during the day that he'd been out of the city. Well, it, it's really awfully hard to explain. Just how affectionate were these calls? Quite affectionate. You think Mrs. Forbes has been playing around? I don't know, sir. But in the last few months, when Mr. Forbes left, she'd informed me she was going to town to visit with friends. And she'd very seldom return until the day before Mr. Forbes was supposed to be back from his trip. Why, on one of these occasions, it, Mrs. Weatherwax, the woman Mrs. Forbes was supposed to be visiting, came to the house calling on Mrs. Forbes. Well, from her conversation, I gathered she hadn't seen Mrs. Forbes for some time. Did you say anything about it? <laughs> to whom? To Mr. Forbes? Certainly not. I didn't think that much about it at the time. Hmm. Anything else? Uh, no, sir. But I suddenly felt that I must tell someone... Uh, sir, if Mrs. Forbes should find out, she'd surely dismiss me, and I couldn't blame her. I won't say anything. Thank you, sir. Well, come on. We'd better start back. I do hope I haven't started something I'll be sorry for. Do me a favor. Well, certainly. If Mrs. Forbes gets any more of those phone calls, see if you can find out who's on the other end of the line. I'll try. You can reach me at the Madison Hotel. Yes, sir.
I drove William back to the house, then headed for the city. It was close to 5 o'clock when I got back to my hotel and called Lieutenant Parkhill. I told him about my conversation with the butler, and he was interested. He agreed to do some more checking on Mrs. Forbes' friends, especially the men. Expense account item 3, $7.50, dinner. After which I took a short walk, then returned to my hotel to get a good night's sleep. I was just turning off the light when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is William, Mr. Dollar, the Forbes butler. Oh, yes, William. Uh, Mrs. Forbes received a phone call about half an hour ago. You find out who he is? Uh, No, sir. Well, that's not going to help much. Uh, I thought you could discover his identity. How could I do that? Uh, Mrs. Forbes just left the house. I overheard her agree to meet the party in the city. Where in the city? Well, I don't know, but I thought you could intercept Mrs. Forbes as she comes off the George Washington Bridge. William, you have the soul of a Sherlock. Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Forbes is driving the gray Cadillac sedan. License number 6A31593. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, It's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. It took me five minutes to get back into my clothes and make it down to my car. Twenty minutes after that, I was parking at the city side entrance of the Washington Bridge, waiting for Mrs. Forbes to show up in her gray Cadillac. I waited about a half hour. She came off the bridge doing a little better than the speed limit and turned south. I started tailing her. I stayed about a block behind, and Mrs. Forbes led me across town. Suddenly, at the corner of 41st and 5th, she pulled up to the curb and a man stepped up to the car, quickly opened the door and climbed in. They drove away and I continued to follow. I followed for about another hour while Mrs. Forbes just drove around, obviously headed for no place in particular, just talking things over with her passenger. About 11.30, she made a left turn, cut back across town and pulled up in front of an address on 108th Street. Her passenger got out, said something, threw her a kiss and went into the building. After Mrs. Forbes had driven out of sight, I went down to the building the man had entered and looked through the glass door. He was going into an apartment at the end of the hall. I checked the apartment number, 1D. The nameplate on the mailbox outside was Roger Phillips. Now, I don't know Roger Phillips, Dollar. Name's familiar, though. I'll check on it. Where are you? In a drugstore in the corner. Hey. What? Cab just pulled up in front. Of the drugstore? No, no. 953 East. I can see it through the... Hold it. What? I'll call you later, Lieutenant. My man just came out. He's getting into the cab. Goodbye. The cab was two blocks away and turning left by the time I was able to follow. It led me across town to the waterfront in a small, tired saloon named the Blue Toad. I watched while my man paid off his driver, then I followed him into the dive. The Blue Toad was one room, a few tables and a bar. The customers were off the waterfront, seamen, stevedores, and bums with saltwater faces and an occasional tattoo. The air smelled like stale beer, live bait, and bad tobacco. 
I watched my man cut his way through the heavy blue haze and sit down. Another man sat at the table. A short man with a dark face. I found a table near the door, gave my order to a waiter with a crusty apron, and relaxed to see what was going to happen. Hello. Huh? Oh. You alone? Oh. Yeah, but uh, I'm... Uh... Buy me a drink, huh? Sure. Well, what will it be? Champagne. Huh. Doesn't that get a laugh? Was it supposed to? Well, if I was a nice-looking guy, wearing a nice-looking suit, and I just walked into this dump, and a dame like me ordered champagne, I... Oh, forget it. I was just trying to start a conversation. You started it. I work on a percentage. Buy me a scotch, and I'll leave you alone. Relax. I'm not expecting anybody. Thanks. You got any influence with the waiter? I ordered a drink ten minutes ago. He's probably out in the alley. It's not well. About this time of night, he can't stand the smoke and goes out to stock up on fresh air. He'll be right back. What's your name? Jane. Yours should be, um, Mike. Or Bill. Yeah, you look kind of like a Mike. Why? I don't know. Feeling you get when you look at some people. Some people look like certain names. It's Johnny. Johnny? Doesn't fit? I guess so. Who are you watching, Johnny? What makes you think I'm watching somebody? Because you are. You've been watching those two guys in the back. Okay. Cop? Uh-uh. The good-looking one just passed Timmy a bundle of money. You know the little dark guy? Forget it, huh? Tell me about Timmy. Tell me about Johnny. I'm not a cop. Nope. A cop would know all about Timmy. The good-looking one's leaving. I'm interested in Timmy. In Timmy or the money he just got. Both. You're not a stick-up man, Johnny. Not a bit. I'd like to help, but Timmy finds out about things. Timmy's a bad boy. Hasn't got a friend in the world. <laughs> not even me. You leaving? Yeah. Oh, here. Buy some champagne. Thanks. Bye, Johnny. Outside, the air was fresh and clean. I got into my car, lit a cigarette, and waited for the dark little man named Timmy to come out. In about five minutes, he did. He crossed the street and climbed into a car. He drove west, and I followed. About ten blocks later, I stopped and watched Timmy park in an all-night garage, then crossed to a hotel called the Bayview. He went in. I found a phone and called Lieutenant Parkhill. Timmy? About five feet nine, dark complexion, Dress is a little too sharp. Mm. Timmy Collins. Now, what about him? Bad boy. Yeah, so I've heard. Assassin, but nobody's been able to prove it. I didn't even know he was in town. He shouldn't be. Why not? Uh, it was an old rap, forgery. Huh. You find anything on Roger Phillips? Oh, uh, yeah. Socialite playboy. Makes the columns about once or twice a week. Never very flattering. Does he know Mrs. Forbes? Oh, he might. Runs around in that circle. He's been in town for about a year now. He comes from... What's the matter? Just going to say he comes from Cleveland. Yeah? Just remembered. So does Timmy Collins. Did you check on Phillips in Cleveland? Now the kickback hasn't come in yet. Won't get it till tomorrow morning. Only thing we've got on him here is what I've already told you. What are you going to do about Timmy? Let him alone for a while. Stake out the hotel and see what he's up to. What are you going to do? Go back to my hotel and get some sleep. I'm bushed. And I'll talk to you in the morning. Yeah. Expense account item four, $2.65. Breakfast the next morning with Lieutenant Parkhill at a waffle shop across the street from the precinct. Roger Phillips skipped Cleveland owing a lot of money. The Cleveland report gives him a clean police record, but one thing's pretty interesting... Most of the money he owed was for gambling debts. Owed it to Timmy Collins. Huh. Unless we've wandered too far out in left field, I got a hunch Timmy killed Forbes. Met him on that lonely road by the cliffs and gave him a shove. Yeah, I have the same hunch. Mrs. Forbes falls for Phillips, and together they plan to eliminate the husband. Phillips makes a deal with Timmy, maybe agrees to give him a big interest on the debt when he marries Mrs. Forbes and gets his hands into all that money. 
Does Phillips have enough money to pay for a job like that? Well, if he doesn't, he probably borrowed it from Mrs. Forbes. It was a big stack of bills. Why don't you check with Mrs. Forbes' banks and see if she withdrew a large amount in the last couple of days? All yeah, right. Oh, want some more coffee? No, I think I'll make a call on Roger Phillips. Maybe I can force this thing out in the open. What are you going to tell him? Enough to scare him, get him into action. When people get frightened, they get careless. Yeah, but they can get dangerous, too. You watch yourself. Oh, like a hawk. Roger Phillips was still sleeping when I knocked on the door. I kept pounding till he opened it and squinted at me through puffy eyes. I introduced myself, and he showed me into a well-furnished small apartment. He put on some coffee, lit a cigarette, and sat down on the couch. Well, it's a little early for me, uh, Mr. Uh... Dollar. Yeah. Sit down. The coffee won't take long. You're an insurance investigator. That's right. Well, I don't understand. What do you want to talk to me about? Mrs. Forbes. Mrs. Forbes? You know her, don't you? Mrs. Forbes. Well, I know one Mrs. Forbes, a casual... I'm not going to play with you, Phillips. I'm talking about the Mrs. Forbes who picked you up last night and gave you a large amount of money. Look, I, I don't know what this is all about. I think you do. I said I didn't. I was in my apartment all last night. Nobody picked me up, and certainly nobody gave me any money. You went to a dump called the Blue Toad, and you met a man named Get Timmy. Get out of here. You're in big trouble, friend. I know all about Cleveland and Timmy Collins and Mrs. Forbes. And I think when Mrs. Forbes finds out about the deal you made with Timmy, she'll tell me everything. We'll see each other again. Oh, uh, your coffee's boiling. Well, I'd given him the bait. A lot of hunches, but from his reaction, I was sure I'd scored. I went downstairs, crossed the street to the drugstore waited five minutes to give Roger enough time to make his calls. Then I slid into the phone booth and made a call of my own. Yes, sir. Mr. Forbes' residence. William, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, oh yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. I, I was just going to call you, sir. Did Mrs. Forbes just receive a call? Yes, sir, just a moment ago. It was from the same man. She's going to meet him. Meet him? Where? By the cliffs. <laughs> Phillips had taken the bait. Only two people could implicate him in Forbes' murder, Mrs. Forbes and Timmy, and he'd called Mrs. Forbes to meet him by the cliffs. I put in another call to Lieutenant Parkhill. Yeah, that's right, Johnny. The stakeout has a tap on Timmy's phone. Phillips just called him, said to pick him up as soon as he could. Phillips told Timmy there was trouble, that some guy named Dollar had found out about the whole setup. <laughs> Shame on you. We want to stop a couple killings. We better get right out there couple of killings. Sure. Phillips lets Timmy take care of Mrs. Forbes, then he takes care of Timmy. It's the only way he can protect himself. I'll pick you up in five minutes. Oh, by the way, uh, I checked with the bank. Mrs. Forbes made a withdrawal day before yesterday. Ten thousand dollars. The lieutenant was as good as his word. In five minutes, he pulled his squad car up in front of the drugstore, and I got in. Well, you want to wait for Timmy to pick up Phillips and then tail him? Oh, we know where they're going. Better if we get there ahead of time. Right. The drive was fast. We swung off the main road on the island and headed up the private one to the Forbes estate at about 2.30 in the afternoon. Halfway to the house, we spotted Mrs. Forbes walking along the road by the cliffs. We stopped... She looked startled as we got out. Hello, Mrs. Forbes. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. You've met Lieutenant Parkhill. Yes, uh -huh. hello, Lieutenant. I was just taking a walk. To meet Roger Phillips. I beg your pardon. Oh, we know all about it, Mrs. Forbes. All about what, Lieutenant? Your husband's death. Who killed him? Why he was killed? I'm afraid I don't understand. My husband was... Roger Phillips will be along any minute. The man he paid to kill your husband will be with him. I think he intends to kill you. This is the most ridiculous... Mrs. Forbes. Roger Phillips left Cleveland owing a large gambling debt to a hoodlum named Timmy Collins. Last night, you picked up Mr. Phillips and gave him $10,000, which he, in turn, gave to Collins. And we think he made another deal with Timmy. After he married you, he could pay off his gambling debt with interest. Might as well tell us about it, Mrs. Forbes. 
He doesn't care about you. You and Timmy are the only ones that can implicate him. And he's on his way here right now to see that you don't. I don't believe you. Well, then find out for yourself. We'll duck the car behind those trees and give you plenty of protection when he gets here. Find out for yourself. Park Hill drove the car off the road behind the trees, stayed hidden, and waited for Phillips and Timmy. Mrs. Forbes stood quietly looking out to sea, her hands at her sides, bunched into small fists. She stood like that, not moving, even as the car came down the road, heading right for her. She turned and saw the car bearing down on her and picking up speed, and then she knew we weren't lying. But still, she didn't move, and the lieutenant and I went to work. The car was about 50 yards away when we stepped into the road. Timmy was driving and saw us the same instant Phillips did and tried to put on the brakes as we raised our guns. Oh, what a mess. Yeah. I'm sorry it worked out that way. He was going to kill me, wasn't he? He sure was. You want to tell us about it? Oh, yes. It doesn't make much difference now, does it? No. I'm afraid it doesn't. Expense account item five, $25.88, car rental and gas. Expense account item six and seven, $93.75. Hotel bill, train fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $148.48. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Larry Thor, Jack Moyles, Bob Griffin, Mary Jane Croft, and Jean Howell. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood John Lund returns as Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network.